Hey, I'm talking today with Russell Blake. Russell, how you doing, man? Not too bad. How about you, Jim? Pretty good. Uh, thanks for thanks for showing up. It was uh, we had some tough technical difficulties. And, uh, we were a lot of drama, but <laughs> say what? A lot of drama, but we nailed it. I'm here. <laughs> yeah, you're down in Mexico, right? That is correct. Excellent. So I've lived down here for about uh, 15, 16 years now. So I love nice. it. Um, so yeah. I will start off just by reading a little bit of your Amazon bio and a British version because your bio is quite long. Um, okay. Yeah. Featured in I the need Wall an editor. St yeah. <laughs> featured <laughs> in the Wall Street Journal, the Times, and the Chicago Tribune. Russell Blake is the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and USA Today bestselling author of over 60 novels. Having resided in Mexico for 16 years, Blake enjoys his dogs, fishing, boating, tequila, and writing. His thoughts, such as they are, can be found at his blog, RussellBlake.com. So, hey, Russell, why don't you tell us a little bit about you and your writing? Uh, okay, sure. I am a thriller author. I also, yeah, I write mysteries, thrillers, post-apocalyptic, um, uh, noir. I've, I've jumped around in a few different genres, but I've been writing since 2011. I've written a couple of novels with Clyde Cussler. Um, for Penguin. Um, so I've done the traditional publishing thing. I'm independently published. Uh, I've written something like 64, 65 novels, depending on, you know, how you count them and when. Um, I'm in the middle of another one as we speak. And if you do the math, that's about one novel every five and a half weeks, six mm -hmm. weeks. So uh, I'm a slacker. I, <laughs> I take a couple of days off in between. And, uh, yeah, I've been enjoying it. I'm living the dream. I can't, I think I've sold over 4 million books now. So you know, there's, there seems to be an appetite for them. Thank God. And hmm. uh, hopefully it'll continue. Very nice. So Russell, here's probably the most important question of the interview. Would you rather live on the moon or deep under the ocean? Wow. Um, I'm going to say deep under the ocean because you could probably do what a hydroponic thing which means you could grow agave and grapes, which means you could ferment them and you could make tequila and wine. So <laughs> it'd be difficult to do like in zero atmosphere and gravity. So access to uh, free flowing tequila is probably your, your, main, your main requirement for uh, wh where you live? Oh, I have a few others, but that, that certainly makes everything easier. It's near or at the least top more the interesting. List. Right. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So today we're talking about your favorite thriller, and the thriller that you said you want to talk about is also one of my favorites. It's Silence of the Lambs by Thomas Harris, which is the yeah. second book, the second Hannibal Lecter book after Red Dragon is the first one, right? That was awesome, too. I mean, yeah. I've read Red Dragon probably like four or five times, and it's, you know, it never gets old. So can you tell us a little bit about Silence of the Lambs, uh, like kind of a spoiler-free synopsis or a teaser about what it's about? Yeah, it actually, um, Tom Harris, he did something very interesting. He, he kind of single-handedly created the, uh, the serial killer thriller genre. I mean, he really did. And he certainly put it on the map um, with, now, Red Dragon wasn't, um, wasn't as critically accepted as, um, or popularly accepted either as, as Silence of the Lambs. But they both involve, you know, essentially the cops trying to find a serial killer who is extremely smart and, um, you know, seems to be stumping every one of their efforts. So um, I, you can you can go you can't go wrong reading either one of them. Um, I think Red, I mean, arguably Red Dragon is a more complicated thriller. I think, mm. but um, boy, Silence of the Lambs just hits every note correctly. And it really is like going to school reading it, like if you mm. write in the genre. So what's what's it about? What's the what's the kind of a well? It's it, the it's a it, the protagonist is uh, Clarice Starling. She's you know a young um, female, uh, I guess, student in the FBI Academy, and she's sucked into this uh, into this plot where the FBI is trying to find the identity of a serial killer known as Buffalo Bill because he skins his victims. Um, and, uh, he, he, you know, it, it goes from there. So, so he, she's trying, she joins the effort very unexpectedly. And, um, 
you know, I find the book really interesting because of the way both the protagonist is developed, like the character arc of the protagonist is relatively complicated and it's surprising. And then because of the way the, the ancillary, the secondary and tertiary characters are developed. I mean, they're really richly developed and any one of them is deserving of its own book. Mm -hmm. So it's a chase for a serial killer. That's what it is. It's a search for a race against time um, where the good guys are looking to catch the serial killer before he can kill again. One of the things I, I think was so interesting about the series is that between Red Dragon and Silence of the Lambs, each book has a different protagonist. That you've I don't remember the name. Was it Will, Will something in the uh, Yeah, no, but nobody does. <laughs> nobody <laughs> remembers that guy's name. But Clarice Starling, you know, Agent Starling sort of he he hit the notes right on that one because he I think, you know, the idea of the tortured male protagonist who's looking for the serial killer in Red Dragon, it was good, but he just nailed the, he just nailed the character in, in Silence of the Lambs, like the Agent Starling, because she's, she's young, she's female, um, she's, you know, she's dealing with a lot of, you know, all of the issues you would expect of, you know, trying to make it in a man's world, because that's what the FBI is. So I think he just created a much richer, more accessible character, like mm -hmm. more interesting. And she's young, she's hungry, she's got some ambition, and she she stumbles a little bit because she's inexperienced. Uh, I do remember that. Yeah, and she's yeah she's avaricious. She she wants to she wants to prove herself and show that she's as good as anybody else. Um, but she also comes from an impoverished background. You know, I think the book refers to her as white trash more than once. So, you know, she's straight out of the trailer park and she's trying to to um, advance beyond that. Just it's kind of the American dream encapsulated in a character. Mm -hmm. So it's compelling for that reason, because everyone's been in a situation where they were young, they were inexperienced, they wanted to prove their chops and show they knew what they were doing and they had to do it against adversity. So the series is called the Hannibal Lecter series because I've, uh, and even more as the series goes on, Hannibal Lecter becomes more and more of, an, of, a, of a figure. Tell us about Hannibal Lecter and what makes him compelling. Oh, he is arguably the most interesting um, villain in, in literature. I mean, I can't think of one that's more richly developed and more interesting. Um, he's a complete psychopath. He's a monster. He's also a psychiatrist, so he um, understands all of the psychological theory behind his crimes. And he's wildly erudite. He, you know, he speaks Latin. He he, he studies ancient history. He's, um, you know, I, who knows how many languages he speaks, but probably a bunch because he, I think, he quips in various languages through the book. But he is also just a stone cold killer who enjoys eating his victims. And the art in that, the lesson as to an author, um, not to discuss craft, but the reason readers find him fascinating is because he's an absolute monster. He's just atrocious. And yet you can't help but, if not like him, you can't help but be intrigued by him and almost sympathetic to him by the end of the book. That is an amazing feat to pull off, mm -hmm. right? The most reprehensible. I mean, the guy's a cannibal. Yeah. So <laughs> how do you convert a cannibal into somebody that's sympathetic, who has absolutely no remorse, who, who experiences, you know, n nothing resembling um, empathy or caring or about social mores or about people being killed or his own actions, doesn't give a shit about any of that. And yet by the end of the book, you're like, kind of, you've warmed up to him. Mm. I know they've made, they've made a bunch of different movies from all these Thomas Harris books and some are better than others. Did you, did you see the Hannibal yeah. TV show? Uh, no, I, I haven't watched TV in, well, since I moved to Mexico, but I saw the movie Hannibal, which was not as good as Silence of the Lambs, right. but, the, uh... you know, focused on him. The, uh, the Hannibal TV show with Mads Mikkelsen was actually excellent. It was a very, very well-made show. Um, really? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was very good. It lasted about three oh, seasons. I'll have to get that. it on Netflix or whatever. Yeah, it lasted about three seasons before it got canceled, I think. But yeah, it was very well done.
Um, huh, okay. So would you describe Silence of the Lambs as a page turner? Absolutely. I mean, the point is that, you know, in a, in a, in a classical thriller, um, you want to build momentum. I mean, obviously, you have to open with a bang with something that catches the reader's attention, but you want it to accelerate and continue accelerating all the way through the book and build to a point where you're literally, you know, can't turn the pages fast enough in the, in the denouement and the conclusion. And the book does that. I mean, it's pitch perfect in terms of pacing. In mm -hmm. fact, it's, it's arguably pitch perfect in every way. In mm -hmm. terms of character development, in terms of the protagonist arc, in terms of the villain's arc, in terms of, I mean, I can't think of anything I would change. I mean, yes, he changes point of view a bunch of times, but he doesn't do it in an annoying way that you can't follow. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just literally one of the most perfect um, examples that I've read. And I've read a lot of them. Do you think that Silence of the Lambs has a theme or a message that it's trying to get across? Well, yeah, don't eat your neighbor. Uh, <laughs> sure, I, I think there's multiple themes. That's one of the things that, you know, it's thematic in the sense that it, 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 it categorizes or it follows the career arc of the protagonist where she goes from sort of a clueless ingenue who is, you know, aspirational um, to where she, over the course of the book, you know, sees the real world and is exposed to how the sausage is made and becomes increasingly jaded as she goes through the book. And it's very similar, like the movie, I don't know if you ever saw it, Sicario? Mm-hmm, yep. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very similar to the character arc of that protagonist who starts off, you know, so bright-eyed and, and bushy-tailed and um, ambitious, but also idealistic. And by the end of the book, it's sort of like, you know, she's got to win, and yet she's left kind of, you know, just jaded by the system not being what it is that she believed it to be. So that's very interesting. You get a somewhat of a character arc with the villain, you have, you know, her supervisor, Crawford, I think his name is, who also experiences a character arc. So everybody in the book is richly developed and, you know, has a story worth, worth following. So, yeah, the, I think the overall message of the book is one that is not exactly upbeat. It's not, it's certainly not optimistic. And yet, um, you know, you're satisfied. It's cathartic. At the end of the book, you, you feel satisfied with the conclusion and you feel satisfied that there's veracity to the story, that mm -hmm. it just feels, it rings true. Because the world isn't, you know, it isn't marshmallows and rainbows and unicorns, at least not where I live. So, so, you know, things don't always work out exactly as you want them to. So that's what provides the grittiness and the veracity that I think resonates with readers. Mm. Would that it were made of marshmallows and unicorns, Russell. Wouldn't that be neat, Chocolate <laughs> Rivers? It'd be, uh, sign me up. Um, so have you read, I know uh, Thomas Harris has written a couple of books that don't have anything to do with Hannibal Lecter. Have you read his other stuff? No. <laughs> I, I just have not had any interest in, you know, because basically if you, if you I mean, the, the, the hook really is Lecter. I mean, mm -hmm. that is the hook. That's why I think the films all try to focus on that and use that as the, and I'm sure the other books are, are brilliant. You know, I mean, he's a good author. He's very competent and he, you know, certainly has his chops down, but I have limited time to read. So when I do read, it helps if it's about a character that I'm already deeply interested in. Mm -hmm. And that's why I just haven't, you know, read anything else. I heard an urban legend once about Thomas Harris that I don't know if this is true, but this is just what I heard that he writes a book, gets his advance, then uh, lives on royalties and just hangs out for a while. And then when he starts to run out of money, he sits down to write the next book. But that's <laughs> well, that, that certainly wouldn't surprise me. I mean, that's the story of just about every author on the planet. Are you kidding? Well, it helps explain the, the long absences in between his books that he is, you know, when he finishes the book, he doesn't get to work on the next one. He only does it when he realizes that he's going to be broken destitute if he doesn't write 
sit down and, and that's pump out. That's always been my motivation. I don't know about you, but I mean, that's always my motivation. It's like, I wouldn't roll out of bed in the morning if I was already rich. Yeah. We're, when people ask me where I get my ideas from as an author, I usually tell them my mortgage or my car payment. That's where I get my ideas yeah, from. Yeah. Desperation and greed are, are <laughs> tremendous um, cathartic impulses. Absolutely. Um, so Russell, what book of yours would you like to talk about today? Um, well, I mean, since we're talking about Silence of the Lambs, probably the first book I ever wrote many years ago was called uh, Fatal Exchange. And it also um, is a, a serial killer um, centric book with multiple plots. And the exercise there, I mean, it was my first book. So I was very taken with the TV show 24. I mean, this was, you know, and, and, and I loved the way that they were able to um, follow multiple story threads that then dovetailed in and all made sense. Like at the beginning, you were like, what the hell is going on? What does any of this have to do with anything? And then by the end of, of the episodes, you were like, ah, I see where it all tied together. And you had that aha moment. So my attempt was to do the same thing. And basically, there's two, um, there's two plot um, points that start out, which is that Myanmar is counterfeiting U.S. $100 bills in order to bring down the U.S. economy. You know, this was before the Fed started basically doing the same thing via quantitative easing. <laughs> so I used Myanmar. Um, and then the other one was a serial killer is killing young bike messengers in New York. And it's the hunt for the serial killer, for the identity of the serial killer. So you have two seemingly disparate um, plots that um, dovetail by about the midpoint of the book and develop and then conclude by the end of the book. And I wrote a, a sequel to it uh, that also did very well. So that was my first novel. And, you know, I went back and read it once about two years ago just to make sure that I wasn't off the reservation. And it, it, reads, it holds up very well. I mean, it reads extremely well. So you've just got, that's the Fatal series, uh, series, and there's two yeah. books. Do you ever plan to turn it into a trilogy? You know, probably not unless somebody options it for movies because I, I'm, uh, you know, I just, I'm very pragmatic. I follow the money. So, mm -hmm. you know, my, my biggest selling series is Jet. It's got, I want to say, 16 or 17 installments in it now. Um, and that series is probably responsible for a couple of million books sold. And then I got my Day After Never series, which is post-apocalyptic. You know, when, when the shit hits the fan and everything falls apart, what happens? That one, I'm working on the 10th installment. So, I, you know, I've just got limited amounts of time to generate content. So I kind of have to be selective where, about where I put my effort. And I have, I want to say, six or seven different series. But I kind of I tend to want to focus on whichever two or three are selling the best. Absolutely. So Jet and Day After Never, mm -hmm. and then I'll probably write another uh, in my Assassin series, which is six deep, but it resonates very well with readership and it has a kind of fanatical base. Mm. Yeah, I read Jet and I enjoyed it very much. I haven't uh, gotten around to reading more in that series, but I did enjoy Jet. I thought that was a it was a well-made book. Very exciting. Yeah, it was just, I mean, you know, I wanted to do something that read like the Bourne, you know, the Bourne series, but I wanted it to be a female protagonist. And I'd also just gotten finished watching Kill Bill and some of the Tarantino stuff. And I just loved the way he sort of, you know, it was just nonstop action. So the exercise there was, you know, to do like an equivalent of a Bond film in terms of, bam, it just opens with an explosion and accelerates from there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I wasn't trying to write literature. I was trying to, you know, put 85,000 words of the fastest reading novel I could. And mm -hmm. I think it worked. I mean, and readers apparently agree because they've been very generous in terms of buying it. So and when it comes they're the to the ultimate test. When it comes to writing, quote, literature, my friend Nick Thacker, he, um, he, he says that a, a reader once insulted him by calling his books airport fiction, but he, he wears that badge proudly. Absolutely. I mean, look, there's nothing wrong with being popular. Like I, I, in my early days, uh, my early career, people would say, oh, this is like Edgar Wright's Burroughs, you know, Tar Tarzan or mm. Conan or whatever. And I'm like, yeah. And I think he sold around 55 million books. So mm, your point is. Right. 
I'd love to be David Foster Wallace. I'd hell, I'd love to be um, James Lee Burke, who really does combine, you know, brilliant thriller with and mystery with evocative prose. That li- he's probably the best living American author, if not mm. author in the world. But the problem is that, you know, I want to sell. So right. you have to balance those two. Right. Absolutely. You're preaching to the choir. Uh, Russell, is there anything yeah. else you want to talk about today before we get out of here? No, I, I appreciate your having me on to talk about Silence of the Lambs. If you haven't read it, um, you absolutely should. This is to your listeners, obviously not you. And it's worth, um, it's interesting to read the book and then watch the movie because it's one of the very few movies besides No Country for Old Men where the script really follows the novel and takes whole passages of dialogue directly from the novel. So um, it's very true to the novel, whereas most, uh, my experience with film is most of the time, you know, the, the, the movie is just a pale imitation of the book. Well, in this case, the movie is very true to the book. Mm. Yeah, No Country for Old Men was another one that I've read and seen the movie. And yeah, you're right. I mean, when you have something that's as perfect as Cormac McCarthy, you don't really need to improve upon it when translating. No, and when, uh, I actually, I, I enjoyed it so much. I went back and I read the script um, mm-hmm. and reading the script is really amazing too, because it's so true to the book and you can see how they translated a lot of his ambient prose and what makes him Cormac McCarthy, um, to, how they translated that so that it would have impact on the screen and capture that sense of, you know, desolate West Texas kind of wasteland mm-hmm. um, and the brevity of the dialogue, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a fascinating script. You can download it, I think, from different sites. But if you ever consider um, trying your hand at script writing, you could do worse than to read that one and to read The Matrix. Right. Well, Russell Blake, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. No, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care. Okay. Ciao.